You know, it was back in the early 90s that I, I read a book. It might have been the only book I ever read. Uh, no, I'm only kidding. Uh, it, was, it was by a guy by the name of John Bradshaw, and it was called Healing the Shame That Binds You. Healing the Shame That Binds You. I, I, I don't remember a whole lot about the book, to tell you the truth, except a couple of little one-liners. The first thing, he described himself, John Bradshaw did, as a block off the old chip, and I thought that was clever. His meaning of that was that, that he, in a sense, didn't sort of learn, Richard, do you have your thing? <laughs> you know what, that might be me. Or <laughs> the temptation, it's one or the other. Temptation. <laughs> Thank you. It is me. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> anyway, John Bradshaw, a block off the old ship. John Bradshaw, he, 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 what he was basically saying was that he, to be real upfront with you, you know, was was almost more than what his father was. In other words, all the sins that have been his father's that so often at times we say, well, we learned that from our parents, you know? That he was even more than that. He was a block off the old chip. But then he made this other, other. God has a sense of humor. I know how to fix this. There we go. Right next to the Bible. Oh. Please forgive me for that, but happy Fourth of July to you too. Um, but then he said this other statement. He said very clearly, he said, he said, you know, most people think that they are human beings, but they operate more as human doings. It was soon after that that Bishop Tutu came out, this is the early 90s, where he said, we are not human beings, truly. We are human becomings. Human becomings. In other words, you're always in process. You're always there. You never arrive. You're always, you know, being molded and shaped by God. I mean, if God is like the potter and we're like the clay, He's got His hands upon us and He continues to mold us and shape us. I was struck by that statement and, and reminded of those statements because... To tell you the truth, in the Old Testament reading today, we have the story of David. We've been getting the story of David through the Old Testament readings for a while. I mean, a couple of weeks back, you had the anointing of David as a king, and then you had the David and Goliath story. And now, all of a sudden, David actually is becoming king. They make him king. I mean, the tribes come together. It's after Saul dies. And... They want to make him king. They say, you know, you've been the one that has let us out and brought us back in at every turn. We're going to make you king. And it says that basically in round numbers, he serves as king for 40 years. But let me ask you a question. When did he become king? I mean, he was 15 years old when he actually was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king. He was 15 years old. At 16, he does probably the watershed moment of his life, you know, David and Goliath. I don't know about you, but that's pretty top billing as far as I'm concerned. You know, I, there's not a whole lot of giants I've killed in my life. That's at 16. Here he is at 30, and he finally assumes the role of king. And then he reigns for 40 years. In those 40 years, well, probably in the next week or so, you're going to hear the story of, well, David, where it says, actually in the scripture, it says, it was the time of the year when kings go to war, but David stays behind, although he's king. And that's when he gets in trouble with Bathsheba. That's not a bad feat. Bathsheba was really good looking. But I mean, when he was... David King. All that time? Part of that time? What was the high point, the low point? 
You know, I think a lot of the times we think of ourselves as, you know, people who sort of we become and then we stay there. Like we've arrived, that, that we are, you know, that, you know, I mean, I, I, let's put it on line, you know, I mean, how many people that have children looked at it as, oh, I got to get them through till they're 18 years old or maybe through college and then they're off the payroll. You know, I laughed when I heard somebody say that the other day. I thought to myself, I'm so glad God never got me off the payroll. I'd be really screwed right now if God got me off the payroll. You know? God never stops calling you children. He never stops saying that you're, you know, related to me. He doesn't ever stop taking his hands off you. He changes the way he deals with you. But he doesn't ever stop. And yet, I think so many times in our lives, I think a lot of us, when we look at what we've done in our life or what we're doing in our life, we think we're done. There is no retirement in spiritual development. Ever. Not even into eternity. I believe that there's spiritual development that as you go through from this life to the next, it continues to go on. And it's being aware that God is with you every step of the way. But how much do you actually spend actually concentrating on that development? And how much do you concentrate on sort of trying to make your life and the way in the world? And, you know, get yourself, you know, notable. You know, I mean, uh, how much do you do that? I'll never forget going off to seminary. You know, seminary is normally for a master of divinity degree it's three years long and so you go off and the first year of seminary and i got out and i'll be up front with you i came home and it was summertime and i was walking around i pretty much thought i knew everything about god <laughs> you know just go ahead and ask me a question I'll, I'll let you know second year after i went through it i was like well i know a lot about him i don't know everything about him but I know a lot about them. The third year I came away from seminary thinking, I don't know squat. <laughs> I mean, I'm at the beginning of something. I'm not at the end of something. And yet, we're saying you're going to graduate. That usually means the end of something. But here I am after 30 some years, 32. I mean, you all know it. I mean, I got to retire at the end of this year. You know, I mean, where am I in my, have I, become a pastor? Am I in the process of becoming a pastor? When was I the best pastor? When did I hit my David and Goliath moment? Have I hit it yet? Have I gotten to where I was supposed to be? Have I checked off all the boxes? Because you know what? That's the way a lot of us live our lives is checking off boxes. You know, I mean, that's, you know, we, we get up in the morning, we say, I have this thing to do, this thing to do, this thing to do. And we check off the boxes, and at the end of the day, oh, good day, I got all the boxes checked. But how do you become what you were supposed to be? I, I was reminded of that the other day, I, as you know, since COVID, I've been riding my, my, you know, my bike every day, basically. You know, I do 12 and a half miles, and... You know, I go from my house to all the way down to Canaveral and back, and, and, and it's great. And it's funny because I've been doing the same trail, you know, now for over a year. And as I'm riding down, and some of you probably have seen me because everybody else, get a helmet. I'm like, no, I have a mask on. It's okay. Um, and, 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 you know, and I'm a, I'm a darker. okay? That's what I've been, a, a buddy that's a fish and wildlife officer said, you're a darter. And he, I said, what's a darter? He goes, you cut in front of people. I said, yeah, I guess I do. Um, but it's funny because as I go down, I have about five places that I think to myself, here's the danger zone. You know, the first one's coming out of my street because you got to cut across Saxon, okay? And there's traffic going both ways. And if you slow down, you know, so sometimes I ride on the wrong side of the road and stuff like that. You know, I probably shouldn't confess this stuff, but I do you know, and then I get on Saxon, and pretty much I'm good to go. I'm all the way down. I'm on the right side of the road. I'm all the way down, and I go. First, then you have the first encounter at Ocean Walk. That's, you know, where people are talking across, and to tell you the truth, 
you know, I hate it when there's a whole group of them going. There. <laughs> you know, but they get down there and going south, usually you don't hit that much. You can, you know, usually you don't get it. And so you get down there and then all of a sudden, you know, you're riding down there. Well, then I have to turn around down at the, the National Seashore, you know, and that means that you've got to make sure there's no traffic coming up before that you're not cutting in front of somebody because you don't want to get broadsided, okay? But then it's really interesting because from that point on, all the way back to Ocean Walk, where you have a whole lot of traffic sometimes coming off the beach, I'm thinking, are people are going to be there? You know, are they going to be walking across? And they better not be walking across. <laughs> Am I going to be able to get around them? If they get on there, can I, maybe I can zip across the, the grass and get up on the sidewalk because I'm not letting them stop me. I'm making some good time here. And let me tell you something, I got the wind to my back because it's out of the south and they better not get in my way. And when I get by there, if I get by there, <laughs> I'm like, oh, now I only have the big cup across Atlantic all the way over and then go the wrong direction down Saxon until I get on the right side of Saxon. And, you know, after getting yelled at a couple of times because I was riding on the wrong side of the road, now I ride down the middle of the road. <laughs> and I think I've got whole lane for me. It's really good. It's Jim Spencer's lane. <laughs> but I have to be honest with you, after giving you that whole description and you're thinking, what's he talking about? The, the reality is this, I hit me the other day, is that why am I looking at my life? Because I do this in so many things as, oh, I made it through the day. I didn't make anything do too much wrong. I didn't, you know, I, I got the boxes checked off. I didn't do too much wrong. I didn't get caught for anything. I'm really doing good. What kind of sick life is that? You got one of those too, don't you, sometimes? And I decided what I was going to do was I was going to try and look at things differently. And when I ride now, to tell you the truth, I spend my time less thinking about what could happen during Ocean Walk and more what's the difference I can make in the world in somebody else's life. Ever since I did that, to tell you the truth, there's been a lot of turtles crossing the road. So I got to stop. <laughs> Pick them up and get them to the other side. But isn't life supposed to be spent more like that? What's the difference you can make in other people's lives, even if it doesn't count, in a sense, in the big scheme of things? Or maybe it does count in the big scheme of things, but in the little scheme of things, nobody knows the difference. How do you spend your time? Because you're in the process of not being a human being, but becoming more and more human and more and more spiritual. You're in the process of moving forward in life to where all of a sudden, you know, you're saying, I'm not moving away from God, I'm moving closer to God. You were created as a child to be one with God. And I believe that when you were conceived and when you were born and probably for, for at least the first couple of years, you and God were so close that you knew Him almost better than your mom and your dad. You might have seen the Lord in your mom and your dad or in other people, but, but the reality, you're so close to Him. And yet, bit by bit, little by little, this world seems to distract us, doesn't it? It moves us away. It makes us say, somehow, well, you know what? We're created in the image of God, but that's not good enough. We've got to make our mark in a different way. We've got to have a different identity. And yet, the true identity is to embrace more and more that image of God, that Holy Spirit that's been given to you. To embrace it and then to live out of it, making a difference in other people's lives, even if, well, they don't even know it. You know, it's interesting because... King David, the watershed of his life, probably of all things, I would have said it was David and Goliath. I mean, that's top dollar. I mean, you're talking headlines there. And yet I got a feeling that what David's life really when he was probably the most engaged with the Lord was probably in some of the darkest times of his entire 
career in his entire way. It's when he finally knew that he was forgiven. When he finally knew that he was in the process of becoming. He, when he finally realized that even though I'm so sad and I've made so many mistakes, that somehow the Lord still loves me. Because after all, what does God say of him? He's a man after my own heart. Even though he made a lot of mistakes. And the more that he moved and moved and moved, trying to be closer to the Lord instead of trying to be distracted from being with the Lord, the more he became who David really was. I'm in the process at 71 years old of becoming Jim. I want to be the best Jim that ever walked this earth. Maybe not the best Jim Jim, but Jim Spencer that I am. I want to be the best I can. I want to be one who, well, maybe everybody will forget me, but I don't know. I don't care. I want to be just me. And I hope that you want to be just you. Because you know what? You're the only one that's like you that's ever going to walk this earth. You're going to be the only person that is you that walks this earth. And make it count not by the distractions of the world, but by the intimacy of the living God. Of being there with that. You know, there's a, another book that I read years ago. It was a little story. It's only about a paragraph or two. It was in, believe it or not, Chicken Soup for the Soul. It was the story of a little girl by the name of Saki. The story was written by a guy by the name of Dan uh, Millman. And he talked about this little four-year-old by the name of Saki. Saki lived in a family, and, and she was an only child. She was a sweet little girl. And uh, finally, you know, her mom got pregnant with the second child. And when she was pregnant with the second child, Saki was so excited about it having a, a, a baby, you know, in the family that, that she just was overwhelmed, you know, talking to her mom's stomach and being with her mom and being gentle and being kind and all those things to her mom as she went through. The child was born, was a little boy. And, and when he was born, the moment he was born, Saki said to her mom and her dad, look, can I be alone with my baby brother? Well, she was, she was four years old, and they were kind of concerned about that because, you know, I mean, you know, what would happen if she got jealous, you know, she might be a little rough with the child, so they didn't want to leave her alone. They kept on saying no and no and no and no. But as time went on, Saki actually never, ever flinched at two things. One, at being kind to the little child. Just, I mean, being very incredibly overly gentle. And never ever stopped making the request. In fact, the request started going up more and more. Finally, the parents relented and said, okay, you can be alone with the child. And like most four years old, they went in, they tried to close the door, it didn't close, and it was open just enough so that the parents could stand at the door and hear what Saki was doing. And what they heard Saki do was go over to the little brother and say this, baby, tell me what God feels like. I'm starting to forget. I hope you never forget ever what God feels like. He feels you every minute. That's the reality. He's always felt you. He'll never stop. And he wants intimacy with you more than anything else. And it's, it's not a huge thing where you perform for him because you don't perform for him. That's only going to move you further away from him. It's where you respond to the fact that he loves you. And just know that he loves you and then respond back by loving him and loving the people that cross your path a little bit more. And it's not about getting all the boxes checked. And it's not about sort of doing it all right. And it's not about making sure, you know, you get everything in order and never make a mistake or never get caught for something you did wrong. Even when you do something wrong, it's 
just knowing that God really loves you and he forgives you. And he just wants you to be in relationship. As you come to the Eucharist, know this. We practice that relationship as you receive the bread and the wine. As you come forward, you practice being intimate with God in holy communion. And he did it all for you, as if you were the only person that ever walked this earth. It's Independence Day. I hope, at least for me, I'm a little bit more independent of that dang list that I've kept in my head for 71 years. Not independent of, and that I declare in a fireworks kind of way <laughs> that the living God is really with me. It's the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen.